huge, huge win. There, there's a saying that ministers will say to one another, part of our job description of sorts, but it's that we want to try and work ourselves out of a job. And uh, that means that we've been equipping and encouraging uh, others to do the things that we do. And so this morning we had an amazing worship team of volunteers that came uh, and did this. I want to thank them for an awesome job they did. Uh, this morning uh, we, we started a new tradition, a different way of doing communion and offering meditations. And so this morning in the first gathering, one of our elders, Jim Lee, gave the meditation uh, today, Brent got up here and did it. He said he hated me afterwards, which I totally understand, um, but that's okay because he got up here and he did it and he knocked it out of the park, and I was so grateful for that. Uh, it's just so good to see you guys this morning. It's so good to be here uh, this morning. Uh, you know, it, the reason that we come together for worship, uh, one of the things that our, my whole goal is, is that we are taking this time to find a connection to God, that this moment is one of those moments that connects us to God together. And as we worship him, we sing our songs, these songs of, of praise and adoration to, the, uh, to our Lord and our Savior. It's, it's because he's our protector, right? He, he's the one who provides for us. He's our refuge. And so he deserves our worship. We take these emblems every Sunday to remind us what Jesus did for us on the cross. That, that he, bearing our sins, took the bondage of sin and death and, and offers us a forgiveness and a freedom that we're not going to find anywhere else in this world. We collect an offering to acknowledge God, to acknowledge that he's at work in our life, that he's the one that provides for us. And we're excited because we get to do something that helps other people. The, the funds that we collect go to help others around the world. And we should be excited, excited to worship God together, excited to be in this room together, to look around and to realize we do not go through this life alone. That we, we have others, brothers and sisters in Christ that we can lock arms with. We are not alone as we go through this life. And sometimes it feels that way. We feel very isolated. But that is just not true. We are together. We are better together. And it's more than worth our time to be here on Sunday mornings. This morning I want to start off with a little bit of exercise. So I need you guys to, to follow me. Okay, I need you to reach out. I need you to... Crinkle your fingers, right? Everybody get their blood flowing, right? Come on, everybody do it. Everybody, come on, get your blood flowing, all right? All right, put your arms down. Do your, get loose, right? I'm going to ask you guys for a lot of money here in a few minutes, so I need you to get loose. I'm just joking. All right, ready? Arms back. Get your shoulders going backwards, okay? All right, now I need you to reach down and take your shoe off, right? Okay, everybody reach your, take your shoe off. Show me your shoe. Show me your shoe. Come on, yep. No, don't, Greg. You, you have a long way to go. All right. Yep. Show me your shoe. Okay, here's now what I need you to do. Reach over to your neighbor and have them smell it. <laughs> this morning, we're going to talk about how gross feet are in all seriousness, but we are. Uh, uh, but, uh, but before we jump into our text this morning, I, I want to talk about where our feet take us, right? Because our, our feet, for most of us, for most of us, we have our two feet, and our feet take us places. They're always where we are. Our feet have been there with us in the greatest moments of our life. Everywhere we go, everything that we've been through, they go with us because they're attached, right? They're attached with us. And it's on our feet that we do extraordinary things, that we go to extraordinary places, and that we overcome just extraordinary obstacles, it was on my feet that I walked down the aisle in June of 2000 uh, and got married, right? My feet were there with us, right? It was on my feet in 2004 that I went to Haiti and got to minister alongside a great friend of mine. In 2012, it was on my feet that I finished my first 5K, right? And I'm running, and this is, this is the very first, the first 5K I ran, and, uh, and in my mind, I'll be very just blunt and honest. In my mind, I'm going, please do not let these two kids beat me. That's all I, that was it. I was just thinking, do not let these two kids beat me, right? Um, I trained for months for that 5K. We lived in Northeast Ohio. So in the winter, you don't do a lot of outside running. So I was on a treadmill night after night uh, at our local YMCA training, which was for me was just really, really hard mentally. I, I, in high school, I played football. I ran track to stay in shape for football. So running 25, 30 miles a week was just not uncommon. At 16, we ran 
all the time. We were always running to stay in shape. But at 32, uh, it was the greatest challenge of my life. 3.11 miles was way more uh, and way further than I could have ever imagined. And, um, and so, you know, so we went out there and we ran. And, and it, to me, it was a great accomplishment, a great accomplishment to come across um, that line uh, to, to finish that race. I remember there's a, a point in the race uh, where we came up and there was just this gigantic hill. And I was like, oh, my. And I, I walked that hill. There was no way I was going to make it up that hill and finish the race uh, standing up. So I walked that hill. But I remember crossing that finish line. I remember sprinting to the end so that those kids didn't beat me. And, um, and, and I remember it being one of the greatest accomplishments I felt of my 30s uh, that I got to do that. Um, and, and in life, we all have these challenges that we overcome, challenges that we challenge ourselves with, challenges our teachers give us, t- challenges our mentors may give us, our bosses may challenge us to step up, our spouses, our loved ones, maybe the ones that challenge us to be better, even our children at times challenge us. Sometimes we can let challenges become bad and they can push us off into negative ways or drive us towards negative paths. But for the most part, challenges are good. It's good to challenge us. It's good to overcome challenges. They, they push us. They refocus us, right? They have the power to motivate us and, and get us to places that we've, we've never been if, if we would just push through. This morning, we're going to be challenged. We're going to be confronted with a, a great challenge, But it's not just a challenge. What we find is that on the other side of that challenge is actually great blessing. There's a blessing with the challenge that we're gonna that we're gonna face this morning. Before we do that, we do this thing at Homeport called the question of the day. We're just gonna take just two moments, and I want you to turn to the people closest to you, and I want you to just share what is one challenge that you have overcome in this life. What is one challenge you've overcome in this life? Take literally just two minutes, and we're gonna get right back together. Go ahead and open up your Bibles or turn on your Bible apps to the book of John. John chapter 14, or 13, pardon me, uh, John chapter 13. We're going to be looking at an account uh, of Jesus' life from John chapter 13 in just a moment. We're in a series called Get In the Game, right? We've been talking about moving out of the stands and out onto the playing field. But the problem is, is that a lot of times we like what's in the stands, right? There's a party in the stands. It's, it's comfortable in the stand. It's fun. It's entertaining, right? We love to tailgate and to have that experience. We wear our team colors and we yell our team chants. Uh, and, but when it's all said and done, we just get in our cars and we drive home, right? That, that's what happens. But there's something deep down inside of us that, that wants more Right? There's a part of us that wants to be down on the field in the game, playing our, our hearts out. A lot of times we chalk up that feeling to the nacho cheese we ate, right? And uh, you know, there's this feeling in our stomach and we're like, eh, it's just what I ate. You know, so many times we say things like that. But the metaphor of the game can't be lost or ignored. It's not the nacho cheese or maybe even that breakfast burrito that you ate this morning that is rumbling in your stomach. It's the Holy Spirit that is nudging us and moving us forward, speaking into our lives and calling us out of the stands and on to the playing field, out of our comfortable chairs and into serving. It's a time to use our, ta- our gifts and our talents in ways that impact life. That's called ministry. You are called to a ministry, and it's a ministry to serve God by serving others. That's what we're talking about when we say get in the game. John chapter 13 records the account of Jesus and the Passover feast, and this is what it says. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew the hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them even to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray, to portray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him all authority over everything, that, and that he had come from God, and he would return to God. And so he got up from the table, he took off his robe, he wrapped a towel around his waist, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had around him. 
Now, now this account was something that would be very, very common to a Jew in Jerusalem or in that whole, in uh, that, uh, just a whole modern era, right? They didn't have closed-toed shoes in the first century, right? They're not like us. They didn't have paved sidewalks. They didn't have asphalt roads, right? They had dirt roads. Everywhere they went was dirt. They didn't have carpet in their houses. They had dirt floors in their houses, right? So everywhere they went, they had dirty feet. And so they would constantly, every time they would enter into a house as a guest, the, the host would have somebody, a servant, a slave of some sort, that would wash the feet. They would wash the feet, the nasty, grimy, junky feet from walking in the dust all day long. And that's what Jesus gets down to do. He doesn't have a servant. He doesn't pay us a, a servant. He doesn't have a slave. He gets down on his own, wraps a towel around his waist, and washes the feet of the disciples. Verse 6 says, when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? No, Peter, I'm not going to wash your feet. What was he thinking, right? Jesus replied, you don't understand what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash wash you, you don't belong to me. And I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that. It, it's a very Christian thing to do to wash feet, right? I mean, like, if, you've, if you're not outside of the church, you're like, washing feet, like, that's really weird. But, like, on the inside, there are times when people wash feet, like when we're ordaining a leader or different moments. If you're wanting to do something, you may have been or experienced uh, a washing feet or, or feet washing ceremony. And it's really, really strange. And I, I will admit, it's one of the oddest things that we do from our perspective uh, to wash someone's feet because to wash someone's feet is this very like intimidating yet intimate moment where you're touching somebody else's feet and like I don't touch people's feet right I mean like I don't know where your feet have been and I don't know how often you wash your feet so like so to wash somebody's feet and I think that's what Peter's feeling Peter's like "Uh, Jesus I don't want you to touch my feet like this is gross like, I mean, like, he's used to having it done, but still, like, not by Jesus, right? And so Jesus says that if I don't wash your feet, you don't belong to me. In verse 9, Simon uh, exclaimed, he said, Then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, A person who is bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, you are not all clean. John gives us a little bit of commentary there. In verse 12, it says, "Washing their feet, uh, after washing his feet, he put on his robe again. And he sat down and he asks them this question. Do you understand what I was doing? Do you get it? The son of man just washed your feet. Last week, we were talking about James and uh, his brother John and how they wanted to sit at Jesus' left and right hand. They wanted those powers of position, or those positions of power, if I get my P's in the right order, uh, that, that power of position. And Jesus said, do not be like this world. The world lords power and authority over it is different with you. And then he says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and lay his life down as a ransom for many. He set this example out, and here it is again. He's asking the question, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, verse 13, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I am Lord and teacher, have wa- or since I, the Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you this example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Serve. Jesus isn't really talking about washing each other's feet like this is going to become one of those sacraments of the church. And, and it doesn't become a sacrament of the church. It's something that we do from time to time. But the New Testament, the rest of the New Testament doesn't talk a lot about it. The early church fathers don't talk a lot about washing these feet washing ceremonies like we do communion or baptism or offerings. Uh, but what Jesus is saying, what he's hoping for them to understand And he says, someday you will understand it. He's talking about service. That the Son of Man would get down and do the dirtiest job. Right? Like Mike, think of Mike Rowe on television, right? He used to do that show, Dirty Jobs. And you'd see him and you'd be like, oh my word, like that's just gross. Like that. But that's that's what Jesus is saying. You are seeing me do the thing at the very, very bottom. I washed your dirty feet. Do as I have done to you. 
Verse 16 says, I tell you the truth, a slave is not greater than the master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. And I don't know that we've ever connected this idea of blessing and serving together. We know that we receive a blessing. Like we feel blessed when we go out there and we do something or we get to use our hands or we serve someone along somebody. We use our gifts and our talents. When we come out of that moment, we feel blessed, right? There's something, there's this peace that's upon us. We feel the spirit of God upon us and we feel that blessing and, and, and that needs to be a connection, God will bless you for doing these things. God wants to bless us. And so many times you hear so many people say, I feel disconnected from God. I don't, I don't feel God's presence in my life. And my question is always, are you doing the things that God's called us to do? And if God's called us to serve and in that service there's blessing, then that's where you're going to feel God's presence. And if we're not serving, if we're not feeling God's presence, there may be some correlation to that that we need to examine. I wonder, though, what is your favorite sport to watch on TV? Anybody like football fans? We've got some football fans. Yeah, some other sports. I remember I used to watch NASCAR a lot. And watching NASCAR is great because all you have to do is you watch the first five laps, you fall asleep, and then you have someone wake you up when you get to the last ten laps, and that's all that you need to see. There's nothing in between, a couple of pit stops, but all the great wrecks are going to happen in the last 10 laps because everybody's jockeying to win and uh, get to that finish line first. So, you know, you love that. That's that's when you watch um, NASCAR and they ought to promote it that way. Right. It's a sport with a built in nap. Um, and so so you have NASCAR. Um, how many of you guys are, are so football fans, pro or college? Anybody? Pro. Some college, okay, some of that. Uh, anybody like to watch baseball or golf? I'm so sorry for you guys watching baseball or golf. Man, great to play, but who would want to watch them on TV, right? I just, how many, anybody watch rugby? Anybody rugby fans out there? Rugby is not really an American sport. We really never get into rugby. But there's this rugby team in New Zealand, and they're called the All Blacks. And the All Blacks do this thing called the haka before every match. That, that's a picture of them in the middle uh, of the haka. Uh, the haka is a tradition it's a traditional war cry. It's a war dance. It's a challenge from one, uh, one, uh, uh, one uh, village to the next, right, whoever they were going into battle with. And it's this posture dance, and they perform it as a group, and their movements are, are together and synchronized. They're vigorous movements of stomping their feet rhythmically. They're shouting and accompaniment, doing all this stuff. And these war hakas were perf- originally performed uh, by warriors as they were going into battle. And across all the Polynesian cultures, they would do uh, something similar to proclaim their strength and their prowess uh, in order to, to intimidate their opponent. It was a challenge. Look, this is what it looks like. You can kind of hear the guy yelling in the background. They're serious, right? I mean, 
when you go up against Satan the next time, pull your haka out, right? Slit your throat, stick out your tongue, slap your arm, right? This is what they're saying. This is the, the haka that the all blacks say. They say, let me go back to my first gasp of breath. Let my life force return to the earth. It is New Zealand that thunders now. This is my time. It is my moment. Pa- the passion ignites. This defines us as all blacks. This is my moment. This is my time. Or my time. This is my moment. The anticipation explodes. Feel the power. Our dominance arises. Our supremacy emerges to be placed on high. Silver ferns, all blacks. Silver ferns, all blacks. All high. That, that's what they're saying in this great challenge that they give. Before every match, they invite the other team to come out and to watch them give this challenge. What a way to start a match. Could you imagine being on the other side of the field, watching these guys, these guys stomp and slap and stick out their tongues and slit their throats and telling you how this is going to go down, right? This is pretty bad, right? But here's the thing. When Jesus gets down and he washes the disciples' feet, he is giving them a challenge. Just like the haka, which is very visual, and the steps and the words have deep meaning, the dance is a a stunning difference than what you would approach or what you would imagine you're approaching when you're uh, encountering uh, uh, another uh, another country, another uh, warrior on the other side. But when Jesus challenges the disciples in this very visually stunning way that he gets down on his knees and he washes the disciples' feet. The words that Jesus used give great meaning to the heart of the action of the servant. It's a very similar challenge. Like the All Blacks, we want to be victorious on the field. Maybe not on the rugby field, but definitely in the field of life. And when we're out there uh, being a challenge to serve, we don't always, service doesn't always line up with our worldview of how we think our life is going to go, that we would be in the shoes of a servant. It's not the first thing on our mind. And I'm not sure what deters us more. I don't know if it's the feeling that we can't cram anything more into our busy schedule, or is it the imposition of having to do one more thing For somebody else. What is holding us back from serving? In the Old Testament, the Old Testament King Solomon, uh, according to the Bible, he was the wisest man to ever live. He was also one of the richest man to ever live. He accumulates so much. He understands and knows a lot about winning at the game of life, right? He's the richest Israeli king ever. He conquers more land for Israel than any other king. He had hundreds of wives, poor guy. Had thousands of concubines. But don't just take my word for it. Listen to what he has to say. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. He says this. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, filled them with all kinds of fruit trees. He's got these groves, huge groves. I built reservoirs to collect water to irrigate my many flourishing groves. I bought slave, both men and women, and others who were born into my household. I had large herds and flocks, more than any of the other kings who lived in Jerusalem before me. So you picture this. Get it in your mind's eye. This guy has got mansions galore on every hill uh, in every different part of Israel. He's got all of these fruit groves, all of these gardens. He's got all these people. He's got all this land, all these herds and, and these flocks that he has accumulated. Verse 8 says, he's, I've accumulated great uh, sums of silver and gold. He's very rich. Treasures of many kings and provinces. Said I'd hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. Somebody yell at me. Who's your favorite band? Favorite, like, all-time favorite band? Would you stop with the Led Zeppelin? <laughs> all right, Eagles, right? So, so Solomon had... The Eagles playing Hotel California on repeat, right? Anytime he wanted to, he could just look over to them and they go into that 17 minute guitar solo and it would be amazing. He had, like, that's what he had, like, envision. This is the stuff that he had. Everything that a man could desire. I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I could take. I denied myself no pleasure. I found great pleasure and hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless. 
It was like chasing after the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. He had accumulated it all, and he found it meaningless. A guy who was winning at what we would call the game of life found it meaningless. He accomplished everything that the world tells us to chase after. Everything that we should be working so hard for. If we could just get these things, we'd be, and fill in your own adjective, we'd be happy, right? We'd be content. We'd be fulfilled. We'd feel alive. We'd feel like we had found our purpose or we had meaning in our life if we just accumulated all these things. But that's not what Solomon said. He accumulated great things. He accomplished great things. But he found it all so meaningless. And if that's true, then why are we chasing after it? Why are we doing the things that this world has called us to find meaning when God has told us where we're going to find meaning and blessing if we would just do the things that he's called us to do? And just like last week when Jesus said that that, um, the Son of Man didn't come to be served but to serve others, and, and if that's what we're called to do, and if this week we're looking at, at the scriptures and, and he's saying, now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them, then it's time that we start doing the things that God has called us to do to find what we're actually looking for, right? That's, that's what we need to do because meaning is found in Jesus. Meaning is found in serving like Jesus. If we could just understand that. Meaning is found any time that we are like Jesus. So anytime we are serving, we are being like Jesus. We're doing the things that Jesus has called us to do. Back to John 13. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master. We are not greater than Jesus. We are servants just like him. A messenger is not more important than the one who sent the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. We just got to start doing them. Serving isn't just something that we do here. We need to be people who will serve everywhere we go. We need to make it a part of our daily routine that wherever we are, we're looking for ways to serve different people, whether it's at home, in our neighborhood, in our workplaces, even in the supermarket, we're finding ways to serve others. This is the Christian life, that we would serve others. That's why we're so different. That's the life that we've been called to. But we need to also be a church family that values serving in the church. Last week, I put this, uh, this uh, uh, image up that had this, the website uh, for our volunteer form. And I asked you guys to go out there. If you're not volunteering to go out and serve or to sign up uh, to serve in the church, you know how many people signed up? Four. I got four responses. And technically, I only got three because somebody did it anonymously. They want to serve, but they don't want us to know who they are. So I had three people who had filled out a form to serve. This week, we've set up a self-serve kiosk in the lobby. If I can't get you to pull out your phone in the middle of a gathering to go online, you could stop on the device that I've got set up for you in the lobby uh, to sign up to serve. And if you're not serving at Homeport, I just want you to take a moment and fill out that form on that kiosk. It takes just a short bit of time. But what we're asking you to do is we're asking you to say yes to serving. Say yes to serving. Yes, to serving in our kids' ministry and making sure the next generation uh, of, of, of children knows that God loves them. Uh, serving in our, our hospitality or greeting ministry so people feel welcome when they come in. Uh, serving on our worship team, helping lead other people uh, to connect with God. We just want you to say yes to serving. Serving is not a matter of the mind, or not just a matter of the mind. It's also a matter of our hearts, that we would see in our hearts that we our servants, that that's what God's called us to do, is to be like Jesus. So I ask you, are you willing to be a servant? Are you willing to be like Jesus? Are you willing to accept this challenge that he's laid before us? Not to be great like the world sees us as great, but to be great in the kingdom of God, just like him. Are you willing to say yes to serving at Homeport? Why don't you guys pray with me?
Father God, this morning, we come before you. We see the example that you have left for us. And, and, and Father, I pray that in these moments that, that our hearts would be challenged. But not that we just be challenged, but that we, would, that we would respond. That there would be a response to what, uh, to what we're feeling inside. And so this morning, Father, I just pray that through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that you would just move in us and that you, you would show us just the greatness that you have done before us. And that, that, we, would, that we would break down whatever wall, whatever barrier, whatever thing that is holding us back. And that we would serve like you. We'd receive that blessing that you promised. Father, be with us. Be with us this morning as we respond to you. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. This morning, as we wrap up our gatherings, I, I just want you guys to take a moment.